I guess we'll start now. Good morning. I thought there was going to be another song. We welcome you today and trust that we'll all be growing in the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ today. Just a few announcements. At 10 o'clock, we have Sunday school, classes for every age, children downstairs, youth next door, and I'm continuing the foundations course in the fellowship hall at 10. Tonight at 6 p.m. is a new members class. Some of you have signed up for that. If you signed up for it, you're... Uh, information is in the library, or it's actually not in the library, it's in the office uh, with your name on it. And uh, there's still room for more. If you'd like to attend that class, please sign up this morning. And before you leave the building, see me to get all the information to prepare for that class at 6. Tuesday at 10 a.m. will be the men's and women's Bible classes. Tuesday night at 6.30 is the deacon board meeting. Wednesday night right here will be our annual report meeting for all the members. You receive this by way of email. If you wanted a printed copy, you signed up for that already. And there's a copy of that in the office with your name on it. So go in the office after this service and find your name and you'll find your printed copy. If you hadn't signed up for one of these printed copies yet and you'd like one, the sign-up sheet is outside of Chris's office, so please do so, and we'll get you a copy before Wednesday. Uh, we want to continue to be in prayer for Elvira Duvall. She had eye surgery. It went well, but she's recovering. Alice Ellis had a fall, dislocated her hip, and she's back home now recovering, so pray for her. Continue to pray for Jimmy Giglio, Rick Strader, and their kuyas as they're traveling. Let's pray as we begin. Our Heavenly Father, we come together to worship you this day, and I pray that you will help us to worship in spirit and in truth, that you will guide us as we sing praises to your holy name and as we study your holy word, that you will guide us into truth. We thank you, Father, that we can pray one for another, and as we stand together in prayer for Elvira, for your healing of her eyes, Father, for your care for Ellis, Alice Ellis, as she recovers from this hip displacement, and Jimmy Giglio and Rick Strader, God, we continue to ask for your mercy and grace and healing in their lives. Help the Rakuyas as they travel, give them rest. And Father, as we pray for our nation, we realize, God, that we are in very, very unusual days, and we would ask for godly men and women to come to the forefront, to stand and to guide and lead us. But we pray that you will work in behalf of our leaders in our country, state, and town. And God, we thank you for those that love you and are standing for truth, and we pray that you will bring blessing to them. Help us, Lord, together today as we lift up the name of Christ and encourage one another in the good works that you've designed in us, that we would serve you and show forth those good works that are in Christ. We pray your blessing upon us together in Jesus' name, and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Please read together with me today, John chapter 8 and verse 12, reading together. Then Jesus spoke to them again, saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. Good morning, everyone. Good to see all of you again. Well, the Bible tells us, make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Our first hymn this morning, 343, all familiar with it, Amazing Grace. Please, if you would, please all let's stand. 343, going to sing verses 1, 2, 4, and 5. All together. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now am found. Was blind, but now I see. Was grace that taught my heart to sing, and grace my fears relieved. How precious did that grace appear the hour I first believed. Verse 4 Through many dangers tore. And snares I have already come. 
which grace hath brought me safe thus far. Will lead me home together on the last. When we've been there ten thousand years, bright shining as the sun, we know less things to sing God's praise than when we first begun. Amen. It's a great start. Please be seated. Our next hymn, 224. We have come into this house. Together on the first. We have come into this house and gathered in his name to worship him. We have come into his house, gathered in his name to worship him. We have come into his house to worship Christ, 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 Christ the Lord. Worship him, Christ the Lord. Let's forget about ourselves, magnify his name and worship him. Let's forget about ourselves, magnify his name and worship him. Let's forget about ourselves and magnify his name and worship him and grow. All right, our next hymn, The Light of the World is Jesus. This one isn't in our hymnal, so it's on the board. The Light of the World is Jesus. We're going to sing verses 1, 2, and 4. All together. The whole world was lost in the darkness of sin. The light of the world is Jesus. Like sunshine at noonday, his glory shone in. The light of the world is Jesus. Come to the light, tis shining for thee. Quickly the light has dawned upon me. Once I was blind, but now I can see the light of the world is Jesus. No darkness have we who in Jesus abide. The light of the world is Jesus. We walk in the light when we follow our guide. The light of the world is Jesus. Come to the light, tis shining for thee. Has dawned upon me. Once I was blind, but now I can see. The light of the world is Jesus. No need of the sunlight in heaven, we're told. The light of the world is Jesus. The Lamb is the light in the city of gold. The light of the world is Jesus. Come to the light, tis shining for thee. Sweetly the light has dawned upon me. Once I was blind, but now I can see. The light of the world is Jesus. 
Jesus. Great singing. Our second reading is from the Gospel of John, chapter 12, verses 42 through 47. So once again, if we could read this together. Nevertheless, even among the rulers, many believed in him, but because of the Pharisees, they did not confess him, lest they should be put out of the synagogue, for they loved the praise of men more than the praise of God. And Jesus cried out and said, He who believes in me believes not in me, but in him who sent me. And he who sees me sees him who sent me. I have come as a light into the world, that whoever believes in me should not abide in darkness. And if anyone hears my words and does not believe, I do not judge him, for I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. Okay, victory in Jesus, number 353. Once again, let's stand, please. I heard an old, old story How a Savior came from glory How he gave his life on Calvary To save a wretch like me I heard about his groaning Of his precious blood's atoning Then I repented of my sin And won the victory Sing it out now. Victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. Then bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him, and all my love is for him. He plunged me to victory. I heard about his healing, of his cleansing power revealing, how he made the lame to walk again, and caused the blind to see. And then I cried, dear Jesus, come and heal my broken spirit. Jesus came and brought to me the victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him, and all my love is to him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing Together on the last, I heard about a mansion he has built for me in glory. And I heard about the streets of gold, about the angels singing, and the old redemption story. And some sweet day I'll sing up it. The song of victory. Sing it out now. Victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. And bought me with his redeeming blood. Love me ere I knew him, and all my love is healing. He plunged me to victory. Beneath the cleansing flood. Excellent. Please be seated. Thank you, all those preparing our hearts together. Let's open our Bibles to the book of Acts, the Acts of the Holy Spirit through the Apostles. It's been a couple of weeks since we've been in Acts with all the other things going on. Uh, we're going to keep up the anniversary uh, focus uh, in the narthex there and some pictures on the bulletin board uh, throughout the month of April since this is the anniversary month. So that was a great day last week, wasn't it? 
great day of celebration. Well, as we are going to reflect on what we've seen, Paul is on his missionary journey. And uh, what we've looked at already, he's in Ephesus, which is Turkey today, on his third journey. And he encountered some of the disciples of John. You might remember the disciples of John the Baptist. And they didn't know everything, so he fulfilled their knowledge. He gave them more knowledge, of, brought them the faith in Jesus Christ. And then they were baptized in Christian baptism, what we've seen. And they were filled with the Spirit. Uh, Paul continued to preach in the synagogue for three months, and he faced some opposition. Whenever the gospel goes forth, there's always those that are against it, even today. And so Paul settled then in the school of Tyrannus for two years, and God confirmed the miracles. God brought very unique miracles, you might remember, uh, as Paul preached, and it was a confirmation of the message. He then encountered some spiritual warfare as uh, he faced a demon, and uh, that demon resided, and uh, the itinerant uh, Jewish exorcist couldn't remove that demon. Uh, but the demon knew who um, Jesus was. And you might remember what James had to say, the half-brother of our Lord. He said that the demons believe and tremble. And as we encountered that text there, uh, they don't tremble at you and me, but they'll trem tremble at Jesus. And that's what we did. So today, as we continue the third missionary journey, you might have noticed the theme from the songs and readings that we're going to look at the text of Scripture here in Acts 19, verses 21 through 41, and the theme that we've given to it is turning on the light. So as we set the stage for turning on the light, let's remember some things that Jesus said. In John 3, 19, Jesus said, and this is the condemnation, that the light has come into the world. And men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. Uh, that's what Jesus said was the case when he came into the world. Do you think it's any worse now? <laughs> okay, some of you are awake. Yes, it's pretty bad now. There's a lot of evil now. Uh, and it's, it seems to be growing and increasing. And if there was ever a need for the gospel, boy, is there a need today. So what did Jesus say? You are the light of the world. The, the evil is so great that sometimes people want to just run and hide. But that's not the answer. The answer is to let your light so shine. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. So there is physical darkness, but there is spiritual darkness. And the spiritual darkness is even greater. And the light of the world is necessary. So I hope that you're taking that Bible that you got last week and that you've prayed about who you're going to give it to and that you've given it to someone so that the light of Christ might come into them. So our text for today, as we said, is in John uh, Acts 19. Oh, let's lay out the first couple of verses. 19, 21 to 23. It says, When these things were accomplished, Paul purposed in the Spirit, when he had passed through Macedonia and Achaia, to go to Jerusalem, saying, After I've been there, I must also see Rome. So he sent into Macedonia two of those who ministered to him, Timothy and Erastus, but he himself stayed in Asia for a time. And about that time, there arose a great commotion about the way. That's what we're going to look at today, the riot in Ephesus. Are you ready for a riot? We're going to see a riot that's going to symbolize a lot of riots that we see today. Let's pray. Father in heaven, uh, we ask that you will guide us by your spirit into your word. Uh, this was an amazing event that took place in Ephesus, and we thank you for your protection through Paul, and we ask that you will guide us in the things that we need to learn and understand and live out as we walk with Christ in our lives. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So notice here that um, Paul, it says, is purposed in the Spirit. Have you ever wanted to do something that you thought was God's will? And the Lord stopped us from doing it because it wasn't his will. Over in the book of Romans, chapter 15, Paul said, but, no longer, but now no longer having a place in these parts and having a great desire these many years to come to you. Paul was a man who, once he came to know Christ as his Savior, lived in the power and fullness of the Spirit. He was led and directed by the Spirit. There were many places he wanted to go, and the Spirit prevented him from going. 
But there are other places that Paul wanted to go. And so in our text right here, it says very clearly that these things were accomplished as verse 21, Paul purposed in the spirit. I hope that you are growing in your walk with Christ, whereby, as Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice and they follow me. It's not an audible voice. God's not going to speak from heaven to you. But he's going to speak to you through his word, by his spirit. There's going to be an impulse in your heart. There's going to be a yearning in your spirit to do something. Maybe, hopefully, that book that you received last week, which has the gospel in it. You've been praying about who you might give that to. And the Lord's leading you by his spirit to bring that word. And so, by the direction of the Holy Spirit, by God's divine will, Paul is living his life. And we need to live our lives by the direction of God's Spirit. Over in 1 Corinthians, as he mentioned a couple of the helpers, in 1 Corinthians 16, Paul would say, now concerning the collection for the saints, and that gift was to go to Jerusalem because the Jerusalem church was suffering financially. And when one of God's people hurt, other of God's people help. And so here in Corinth, Paul's asking for help. As I've given orders to the churches of Galatia, So you must do also on the first day of the week, let each of you lay aside something, storing up as he may prosper, that there be no collections when I come. And when I come, whomever you approve by your letters, I will send to bear your gift to Jerusalem. But if it is fitting that I also, that I go also, they will go with me. So we're not passing the plate anymore. COVID changed all that. We've got a box in the back and people contribute to that box. And some people have wondered, has that been a good thing? It's been a great thing because the offering only takes place on Sunday morning. And I see people coming in during the week and putting their offering box, put the money in the offering box. So the offering's going throughout the week, not just the first day of the week. It's almost every day of the week the church is open, offering is going. And that's one of the responsibilities we have as God's people to support the ministry. And that's what's going on here as verse 22 He sent to Macedonia two of those who ministered, Timothy and Erastus, but he himself stayed in Asia. So he is imploring others to help in the ministry. And the ministry, as we said, is not a one-man show or a one-woman show. It's involving everybody. We all need to participate together. Now, the focus of our study this morning in in, uh, Acts 19 is going to center around the temple. The temple of Artemis, or in Latin, Diana. And you're going to hear some people shouting out like a a cry, a war cry, about the Temple of Diana. But before we get into that in detail, I want to go back with you in context to verse 20. So if your Bible open to Acts 19, go back with me to verse 20. Because this is really setting the stage for what we're going to see. It says, the word of the Lord grew mightily and prevailed. What is God's word doing today? Well, I want to think back with you about the Word of God in the book of Acts. So I'm going to bring you back to a couple of passages. Back in chapter 6, verse 7, we saw, as the church is growing, remember what happened in Acts 5? Ananias and Sapphira? Two people slain in the Spirit, and they didn't go home to talk about it. Acts 6, the disciples are now going to be, there's going to be deacons in the church to serve. And it says, the Word of God spread... And the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and many of the priests were obedient to the faith. So even those that are a part of the priesthood in Judaism in, in, in Jerusalem are coming to believe in Messiah. So the word of God is going forth. We come to chapter 12, and there's a lot of things that are taking place. By the time we get to chapter 12, there's uh, the Ethiopian eunuch. There's Paul being called to the ministry. It says the word of God grew and multiplied. So the Bible is just increasing in its impact. And then we come to chapter 19, verse 20, in our verse for today. So the word of the Lord grew mightily and prevailed. The word of God is a dominating force. That's the point of these three passages. When we interact with the word of God, we are interacting with something that can change our lives. It can make us different people. It can change our thinking and our behavior. It is a powerful force in in our community and in our world. So the question is, 
Who doesn't want the word of God to prosper? Who is standing against the increase and growth of the gospel? You know who it is? Satan. Satan. We're going to talk about Satan in our adult class this morning. I'm going to finish up the Holy Spirit, talk more about the devil. If you don't know anything about the devil, you'll want to come at 10 o'clock as we unpackage some things about Satan. Satan doesn't want to have the word of God increase. And Satan always seems to find someone in whom and through whom he will work to oppose the work of God. So who is he going to use? Some fella named Demetrius. Look in your Bible with me. Verse 23. And about that time there arose a great commotion about the way. What is the way? That is the gospel. That is the term that's used in the book of Acts for the people who were followers of Jesus Christ. They were members of the way. Jesus made it really, really clear. How many ways are there to heaven? There's one way. I am the way, Jesus said. Now, Jesus is God. So Jesus is saying there's only one way to God. He is the vehicle, the channel, the one who's come to be Messiah, our Savior, we come to him. So now there's a great commotion for a certain man named Demetrius, a silversmith who made silver shrines of Diana, brought no small profit to the craftsmen. All right, so what we have to understand here is that this term Diana is the Latin. You might have a translation that uses the word Artemis. How many of you have Artemis? A couple of you have Artemis. Great is Artemis, great is Diana. Same thing. Now, these shrines were really miniature replicas of, of what they thought the goddess looked like. And Dr. Luke makes an understatement about Demetrius' profit in the business. He says that he made no small profit as a craftsman. Now, we talk that way, don't we? We say, oh, well, you know, we have a meal, and we say, that wasn't a bad meal, right? If you're a child, don't ever say that to your mother. And if your husband and your wife made the meal, don't ever say that to your wife. Don't put it in the negative. Put it in the positive. That was a great meal. But this is what Dr. Luke is saying. That we, we talk this way. We often refer to things in this way. So Demetrius made a lot of money selling these little images. There's a lot of money made every year from people buying and selling religious trinkets. Have you ever seen that? They're all over the place. And so we pick it up, and we see that uh, he made no small profit. In verse 25, he called them together with the workers of similar occupation. So he's gathering all these businessmen together. And he says, man, you know that we have made, we have our prosperity by this trade. Moreover, you see and hear that not only at Ephesus, but throughout all most all Asia, this Paul has persuaded and turned away many people, saying that they are not gods which are made with hands. And so it's really interesting what's going on here. Here this businessman gathers together the other businessmen whose profit has been affected by the gospel. And they accuse Paul. Notice you say, not only Paul, throughout almost all Asia, this Paul has persuaded. And these, it's a very interesting phrase that they use, because is it Paul who's doing it? No, it's not Paul. It's the Lord. The Lord is the one turning people's hearts away from idols to serve him. Paul's simply the instrument. And so he claims Paul to be the one. We know it was really the Lord who was the one. And look at what he says in verse 27. He says, So not only is this trade of ours in danger of falling into disrepute, but also the temple of the great goddess Diana, Artemis, may, ha may be despised and her magnificent destroyed, whom all Asia and the world worship. And so Demetrius presents in verse 27 a threefold danger to the threat of their work. 
Notice what it is. Number one, for we ourselves. The sales are going to decrease and we're going to lose money. That's basically what he's saying here. Number two, the temple will be counted as nothing. People aren't going to want to go to this temple anymore. Where's the temple? They're not going to want to go there anymore. By the way, this is one of the seven wonders of the world, the ancient world, the temple there. And it was destroyed by an earthquake, and then it was rebuilt, and there's just not much of it left today if you were to go there and see it. But he says, people aren't going to want to go there anymore. They're not going to want to buy these little miniatures anymore if this continues. And then number three, she will lose her majesty. There are many people in Asia who worship her. Now, here's a side question. Do you think Demetrius is a real sincere worshiper, or is he simply a businessman? I'll let you figure that out on your own. But it's interesting what's going on here. What's going on here is that the Christian faith is impacting a business that is contrary to the things that, with the way God would want it to be. You know, Paul comes into this culture, this Greek and Roman culture, and he's a God-fearing man. He knows Deuteronomy 6, 4, and 5. You know that one? Hear the Lord, Israel, is one. We are to worship the Lord and honor the Lord, love the Lord with your heart, soul, mind, and strength. He sees people not worshiping God, but worshiping God's. And his heart is moved by this. And so he begins to preach the gospel, and the gospel is affecting these things. And so he's going through this, verse 28. Now when they heard this, they were full of wrath and cried out, and here's their war cry. Great is Diana of the Ephesians, or great is Artemis of the Ephesians, whatever translation you have, Greek or Latin. And Verse 29, the whole city, filled with confusion, rushes into the theater. And here's the theater. They rush into the theater with one accord, having seized Gaius and Articus, Macedonians, Paul's traveling companions. So what we have right here is a mob. A mob of people. Thousands of people rushing to the theater out of this desire to worship their God and goddess, Artemis or Diana. Now, some of us can remember a couple of summers ago witnessing mob rule all over our country in many different places. People just running and doing crazy things and shouting things. And uh, when mob gets control, things are out of control. And that's what is going on here. So verse 20, 30, excuse me, Paul wanted to go. Paul wanted to go into that theater. Maybe Paul thought thousands of people are going to be there. And the amphitheater is so great. Some, I, I was in one amphitheater like this in uh, Caesarea. And you can stand right down in the middle and you can just whisper. And the people way up top can hear. It's an amazing acoustics that are there. And so maybe Paul thought this is an opportunity to hit the masses with the gospel, present the masses with the gospel. But what happened? The disciples would not allow him to go. Paul wanted to go and they said, no, Paul, we're not going to let you go. The disciples would not let him go. Wisdom is often listening to the counsel and reason of others. You see, it is one thing to be in danger and believe that God will help you escape. It is another thing to walk right into danger and presume that God will take care of you. It's sort of like laying on the railroad tracks and praying, God, don't let the train hit me. That's foolish. That's foolish to be that way. So here, these Christians are talking some sense into Paul. Don't go there. They'll kill you. They think you're the reason that they've lost all this money. You've cost them a great profit. Everybody will be nice to you until you touch their pocketbook or their wallet. So, Paul, you've caused these people a great hurt. You know, Christianity should be the greatest threat to a bar, to a strip club, to a pot store, 
and to even an abortion clinic. Christianity should affect the culture because Christians should live in such a way that these businesses will not profit. And when the gospel comes to a people, it should affect the way they spend their money. So look what happens next in verse 31. Then some of the officials of Asia, who were his friends, it's good to have friends in high places, sent to him pleading that he would not venture into the theater. Even these friends of his in government said, Paul, you're going to die. Don't go there. Listen to our counsel. So verse 32, some therefore cried one thing and some another, for the assembly was confused, and most of them did not know why they had come together. What a comment that is. That's a mob rule. You know, if you remember some of the pictures from a couple of summers ago, and then they would, an interviewer would stick a microphone into someone and say, why are you here? Oh, I don't know, I'm just running with everybody. A lot of people don't even know what's going on, and they just follow the crowd. Don't be like that. Don't follow the crowd. Well, they drew Alexander out of the multitude, a Jew putting him in front, and Alexander motioned with his hands and wanted to make his defense to the people. But when they found out that he was a Jew, all with one voice cried out for about two hours. Can you imagine that? Here's their war cry. Great is Diana of the Ephesians. Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. You know, what is today the war cry that is similar to Great is Diana of the Ephesians? There are war cries today. Are you listening? Let me tell you a couple of them. I am Hamas. That's one of the war cries today that people are wanting us to listen to. Death to America. There's another war cry that's coming out that people want us to listen to. Uh, from the river to the sea, there's another war cry that's coming out. You see, we've all heard people calling and shouting things. Now we recognize the evil of some of them. Heil Hitler, remember that one from historically? That was a war cry. And that's essentially what's going on here. It's, it, it's a worship of anything other than God. Great is the economy. There's another war cry. You heard that one recently? You see, it takes strength and courage to stand against the war cries of our day that are anti-God. And this was a war cry in Ephesus of these worshipers of great emotion and pull. Listening to a lot of other preachers getting ready to preach this today. I listened to Dr. James Montgomery Boyce. He's now with the Lord. You realize that. But he was the pastor at 10th Presbyterian Church in Philadelphia for 32 years. And he said there's something very interesting. There's nobody on the planet today worshiping Diana or Artemis of the Ephesians. That whole godless worship of idolatry has disappeared. That one's gone. Why? Because of Christianity. Christianity is what made the difference. It changed the culture. It changed the world. So verse 35, two hours of this war cry. <laughs> Turn it off, right? Change the channel. Let's go watch a ball game or something. What is this craziness? And when the city clerk had quieted the crowd... This is a pretty prominent guy. He, he's more than just the clerk, as Luke gives us the name. He, he's really probably the chairman of the board. They meet every three months. He's a big wig in the community. And he says, men of Ephesus, what man is there who does not know that the city of the Ephesians is the temple guardian of the great goddess Diana and the image which fell down from Zeus? So what, what is this guy saying here? He's saying that, and this is what they believed historically, a meteor fell from the sky. They thought it came from Zeus. And it resembled their god Artemis. Artemis is a really grotesque figure, if you've ever looked it up. It's a, it's a grotesque uh, female, multi-breasted 
Weird, weird image, really. And the gods came to us. This is what he's saying. And they have given us the responsibility to be the guardians of her. So we have an important place in this weird mythology because we're supposed to be the guardians of her. Therefore, verse 36, since these things cannot be denied, you ought to be quiet and do nothing rashly. He's trying to calm the crowd. For you have brought these men here who are neither robbers of temples nor blasphemies of your goddess. Verse 37 is a really great verse because it tells us how Christians live. Look at that verse clearly. Christians don't steal. And Christians don't blaspheme other gods because they're nothing to us. We worship the one true God. And so these Christians are not committing sacrilege against our gods, he says. In other words, these Christians haven't done anything to hurt us. What's your problem? The problem, as you know, is really an economic problem. They're losing money, and that's what they're upset about. Therefore, verse 38, if Demetrius and his fellow craftsmen have a case against anyone, the courts are open, and there are proconsuls. Let them bring charges against one another. Demetrius says, if they want to bring a, suit, a lawsuit against Paul, then go ahead and do that. If it's legal, address it. If it's not legal, leave it alone. But if you have any other inquiry to make, it shall be determined in the lawful assembly. For we are in danger of being called in question for today's uproar. In other words, I've got a particular position in government and the leaders aren't going to look kindly upon this mass riot. So we're in trouble here. If there be no reason which we may give account for this disorderly gathering. And when they had said these things, he dismissed the assembly. So calmed everything down. Everybody left. The riot dissipated. So as we think about Paul's ministry in Ephesus and this church that was started in Ephesus... I want you again to come back with me to Revelation chapter 2. Because Paul's ministry in Ephesus started really, really well. The church grew as people realized we are to worship Christ and not this goddess of fertility. And we need to be reminded as to what God told the church in Ephesus through John. Because often what can happen is over time, our excitement and zeal can wear off. It can fade. And we need to be reminded of what happened to the church in Ephesus. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen. Remember. Do you remember how excited you were about being a Christian, how on fire you were to share Christ with people, how you weren't bashful or shy, you were really, you know, hot for Jesus. Remember, remember what you used to be. Repent, change, confess, and do the first works, or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. Remember, repent, and repeat. That's the message we need when our Christian life begins to become a little stale. When the things of God begin to be, you know, a little boring. Oh, we're going to study the Bible again? Oh. Another prayer meeting? Oh. You know, are we listening? Remember. Repent and repeat. Some of you know I enjoy music, and I was listening to a song recently, and I think the words really fit. It's from DC Talk. It's the song In the Light. I keep trying to find a life on my own apart from you, talking to the Lord. I am the king of excuses. You ever said that? I've got one for every selfish thing I do. What's going on inside of me? I despise my own behavior. You ever come to that point? This only serves to confirm my suspicion that I'm still a man or a woman in need of a Savior. I want to be in the light as you are in the light. 
I want to shine like the stars in the heavens. O Lord, be my light and be my salvation. That's Psalm 27. Because all I want is to be in the light. All I want is to be in the light. You see, if you have come to Christ, you know that the Christian life is an up and a down journey. You're striving for consistency, but that isn't always the path. Sometimes it's like a roller coaster is six flags. And we need to be remembering what the Lord told the church in Ephesus and be willing to repent and then go back and do those first things that we did. Come with me to John 16 as we close. For Jesus said that the Holy Spirit would come. In John 16, verse 5, But now I go away to him who sent me, the Father, and none of you ask me, where are you going? He told them. But because I have said these things you're, to you, sorrow has filled your heart. Certainly they're upset Jesus is going to leave. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It's to your advantage that I go away, for I do not go away. The Helper, that's the Holy Spirit, will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. So Jesus leaves, the Holy Spirit comes. And when he comes... Look at the three things he's going to do. He will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. And so the Holy Spirit will convict us of our need for Christ. And the Holy Spirit will continue to convict us of the sin that's in our hearts and in our lives when we're not with the Lord as we ought to be. But what do we do about that conviction? Do we respond to the conviction and let God's Spirit then move us to the next step? For he will then also convict of righteousness. The righteousness is who Christ is and what Jesus came to do. The fulfillment of what we, what we deserve, the judgment that we deserve, was put upon him. And God's righteous judgment was sent upon Christ. And the judgment is what we deserve. A Christless eternity. Yes, God, that's what I deserve if you were to be just. But yet in your mercy, you extend to me grace. And when we see that, we come to Jesus and we confess our sin and we ask for his salvation. And when we do that, we then have the security of our salvation. But yet we can often fall, even as the church in Ephesus did. So we come back to the Lord again. If we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us and bring us back to himself. But for those maybe today, here or online, who have never come to the light, to Jesus, who will expose in us what is wrong, for the light reveals the sin that is within us. And then he moves us and leads us to himself to bring us to that light, to bring us salvation, redemption, and restoration. Let us pray. Father, thank you for the events of the riot in Ephesus and how you moved a whole culture away from the worship of Diana Artemis to Christ. And even today, there's no one on the planet worshiping Dar Artemis or Diana, but there are thousands, millions who are worshiping Christ. Help us to truly worship you in spirit and in truth and to allow the light of Christ to penetrate our hearts each day and to have us walk in that light. Yes, we struggle, even as Paul would say in Romans 6, what we want to do, we don't do, and what we do, we don't want to do. And we can certainly sympathize with the words of that song of what we want to be. And so help us, Lord, to be able to be all you want us to be in the fullness of Christ in our lives following the light of Jesus. I pray this in his name. Amen. Please stand with me for our closing worship. Number 12, please. Can you hear it? I can't hear it. Now I can hear it. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things shall be added unto you. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Ask and it 
it shall be given unto you. Seek and ye shall find. Knock and the door be he opened unto you. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Man shall not live by bread alone. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Peace to the brethren and love with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.